So welcome to the review of Sailor Moon, 90s show specifically, with some manga and crystal references as well. There's gonna be four sections in this video, and each section is gonna be introduced to you as it comes along. Enjoy! <laughs> So it's time to talk about art aspects of the show. The first pro we're gonna talk about is art design of the setting, decisions about things like cityscape. So for example, right here we see that just the way that it's set up is really pretty. For example, shots like this, they're really common in the show. It's really cool to see. This looks absolutely gorgeous. In my opinion, this is a massive pro for the show. The show genuinely looks pretty all the time, at least most of the time, you know, and just a few examples of that would also be, for example, the fact that all the concrete that's supposed to be gray in the show, it's all lavender or purple or pink, for example, or any other pastel-y kind of color, depending on time of the day and stuff like that. A lot of setup shots that look like watercolor paintings, especially for single shot moments that have some kind of importance, especially it's very very common with Haruka and Michiru. Whenever they are on screen, there's definitely going to be either an entrance or an exit that's going to be made into like a little still, watercolor still, which was probably great for animation in terms of cutting down on the cost. It's great because you get like a few seconds of a still shot and just panning in or out, out of it. I know that it was definitely influenced by the fact that it's so budget friendly, but I don't care. I really like it. <laughs> I, I love those shots. I don't care that they're common because they're so budget friendly. I really don't care. It is one of the best things in this show. It looks really pretty in, and even though it's an old show, I actually kind of prefer this old show style just because it has a lot of texture it seems like. Okay, so one of the cons that we're gonna talk about is animation inconsistency. It's somewhat of a con, not quite as much as it is for many people because to be honest, I usually focus a lot on the artworks and on the art style and art direction of the shows, but I am not not that picky when it doesn't take me out of the experience and I understand that for many people it's kind of a big deal. So there's a lot of different types of directors who worked on this. I mean if you really look at the names it's obvious that there's a repetition happening so it's not like every single episode was made by somebody new it's just that they were constantly switching like each episode would be somebody somebody new usually like they would kind of switch so there's like a certain amount of people that worked on the show and obviously there are differences there's a lot of people who complain about those episodes that are animated by Ando, but like episode 54 for example. And like I get what people are saying, they obviously have their reasons, but considering the time constraints and the type of budgeting that they were working with, I'm not really pressed about it to be honest, and I also don't think that it takes you out of the experience that much. Is the animation always perfect? No. But is it going to hinder your experience of this animation? Uh, also no, I don't think so, especially if you're not that much much of a stickler for art styles and stuff like that. I went to art but even I don't mind it as much because I know that the animation was supposed to be done in a certain amount of time, there's a lot of episodes and I don't think that every single shot is an equally important shot, not every single shot or frame needs to be perfect as long as it doesn't ruin the overall show, overall art direction and I feel like they managed to have a consistent art direction regardless of many people working on the show, mainly because they definitely had some restraints on the color palettes and um, other things like that and obviously there is already a set design for things so yeah Ando has a, a bit of a rounder face to the, his characters and animations and stuff like that for example and it's not like I would pick him over somebody else but I think that it it will not influence your viewing experience as much as some people say it will, you know? So another pro, somewhat of an extension to the art design and direction, which are coloring techniques that are relying on color theory and incorporates a lot of bright colors, specifically. And this point is specifically inspired by the scene from episode 42, where Minako tells Usagi about her experience in England. It's of course true all across the board, it's not something that that's specific to that scene. It's just I think that that scene kind of incorporates or shows off this point best. First, let me visually demonstrate what I want to underline about the way Sailor Moon approaches colors. 
okay? It combines a very bright color with a very bright color to get another bright color to kind of tell you that it's a different environment. For example, in the scene that we're going to look at, Minako's and Usagi's hair is very yellow. The room uses very bright blue colors and eventually you get this type of green for their hair of course if you want to be very dramatic you can go with like a very bright green which would be an interesting choice but it wouldn't work uh, for specifically dark rooms for example because you are mixing it with a darker color so it's going to get darker usually you get this kind of color in those situations with a lot of other shows you probably have noticed it this is a little bit too dark on camera it's supposed to be a little bit lighter i don't know why it looks so dark usually they try to portray shadows or portray dark rooms by dulling down the color and darkening it at the same time so saturation is usually lower and they usually mix it with black unless it's a type of show that also approaches it with some blue or some other color even when they do that even when they approach it with blue and try to retain the color they still turn down the saturation of all colors so it kind of looks a bit more dull to compare to what you see in sailor moon so this this is the colors that I wanted to draw attention to. Pay attention to them in the next clips that I'm gonna show. So here we are with this specific scene. You can see that the room is very, very blue. And instead of going into really, really dark colors, Sailor Moon tries to save the impact of colors even in the dark. So for example, Usagi's hair is really really bright yellow and in this scene instead of going really dark with it they just go a little bit more green with uh, Minako for example they also not only keep the color of her hair to a certain extent of course but also you can see that her uniform which is usually bright orange in some parts is now bright green it's not dark green it doesn't lose any color whatsoever they just go okay so mixing two colors mixing really bright orange and mixing quite bright blue considering that this is supposed to be representing dark spaces it's a very bright color to represent it and they get this bright green that they use instead of losing all the color in the scene they use color theory to show that this is a scene that's going on in a dark space and I really love that because a lot of shows lose that color even when it's animated even when the animation does employ a lot of bright colors oftentimes they do lose these colors in darker spaces they just go with the mixing with black or with gray just going doling down the colors and stuff like that this is more of a technique that's quite rare to see not of course <laughs> insanely rare but it is rare and i really appreciate that because i think that it makes the experience a lot more unique i also just prefer colors to stay vibrant even in dark settings the thing is with this show is that it's not the only times when it employs really interesting colors techniques so for example in this scene in second season we get this kind of interesting moment where the character is not feeling well and we kind of go into this color treatment where everything is inverted like the colors are inverted and stuff like that and of course it's not this isn't used in a lot of other animations but I think that it has a lot more weight when it's in an animation that rarely uses this kind of dark uncomfortable color treatments it has it just has more weight when it's used sparingly especially in an otherwise really bright show and i really prefer that because it's just more interesting this way and i'm sure that that also was a, a really budget friendly way of showing that someone is not feeling well is just having one still change the colors and zoom out of them make it wobble a little bit and even though it is budget friendly as an like you, you would know that as an animator it's still effective and it contributes to the art direction and to this specific flavor of color color treatment that you're using in your show without being too demanding in terms of money and other things like that. It's also used in scenes where there's some kind of shock going on, not just physically feeling unwell, but for example, when something's happening in like a fight. There's also this scene where you could also see how they were treating the colors in a darker space, right? So this is, the, the darkness is a little bit of a darker blue, so the colors are also darker, but still it's so vibrant in cool tones. Let's move on to another 
another pro transformation sequences so with transformation sequences they are definitely iconic there's no doubt about it right i thought that sailor moon was the first one to have transformation sequences in animation i was wrong about that there's a couple of other shows that kind of implement the same thing but sailor moon is the first one that has a whole squad of girls who are transforming it's also the first one that that popularized it so much and it definitely ingrained transformation sequences into collective consciousness when it comes to magical girl genre without this transformation sequence we wouldn't have a million other transformation sequences we wouldn't have Winx that had transformation sequences we wouldn't have Witch that had transformation sequences we wouldn't have a million other animations that had transformation sequences especially when it comes to magical girl shows I also love how unapologetically girly the transformations are which is something that I wouldn't maybe consciously appreciate when I was a child probably didn't, I wouldn't remember mostly because it is such an important part of showing that power and liking bright or colorful or sparkly things they don't have to cancel each other out they can exist together and it's a very important thing when you think about it having this example yeah they're getting earth shaking planet bending power and yes it's transformation into essential involves a new outfit a fresh manicure and a new makeup look and it seems like such a small thing that panders specifically to girls preferences but in a world where most women go through a prolonged stage of internalized misogyny this type of thing is very important because I remember not wanting to be considered girly when I was a child because I felt this power dynamic that kind of put you at a lower position in a conversation or in life in general if you were into those things and this type of media is important to to have as an example because there's so much that you have to unlearn this could be one of the things that helps you feel like like media that's made for girls isn't worse than other things and actually is a lot better than some things you know it takes a lot to unlearn all the things and you suddenly see the value in this combination of hyper feminine fashion and expression of both elegance and supernatural planet creating power all right the next pro excellent choreography or scene blocking even with the limitations of fast produced animated shows so this point is at the same time kind of a on to mostly because of the examples that I'm gonna show you where choreography didn't really work well and it wasn't implemented in the right place at the right time basically just some mistakes that I would have probably just ignored if they weren't so if they weren't implemented in a very specific very important scene and if it didn't contribute to the scene reading the wrong way so even though they still managed to have a lot of weight and a lot of power in for example Senshi's attack not all of them were effective to the extent that they should have been effective, but most of them are. At the same time, we get absolutely ridiculous moments like this one. Let me play that again because this is just... I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. First of all, let's say... This scene is creepy. We we all know that if you've seen the show, if you've seen the show, if you haven't seen the show, once again, this sliding, this sliding in, it's just, I hate it so much on so many levels. It's just not great, okay? Like, it just isn't. In any case, this type of sliding across the screen could work really well in comedic scenes. There's a couple of scenes where it also happens with Mamoru, where he's just sliding off the screen so for example right here where Esmerod she saw a tuxedo mask and she's trying to flirt with him and he just kind of goes uh, okay and just slides off the screen that's funny that is good comedic timing in this case it's part of physical comedy you know and in the case of the previous scene that I showed you where it's supposed to be all romantic and stuff like that not only is the scene in itself creepy because Usagi is passed out it becomes extremely creepy with Mamoru just sliding into the scene being all weird and stuff it's just not the best way to go about this it's just uh, it's just not great it's the same 
same tactic, but it's just not working in one of the cases and it works really well and it's really funny in another case. So it kind of shows what I mean by it being a pro and a con because most of the time it's a pro, most of the time the choreography is great, most of the time even though this is a 2D animation, it has a lot of weight and a lot of good timing to, to the movement to create tension or create this feeling of the attacks being really powerful for example, but in some cases it's just so out of place and it's just not doing what it's supposed to do at all. Most of the time, I can't even, I can't tell you, I can't give you a lot of examples of the bad kind of animation timing, choreography and, and just physical blocking in the shots because it's not that common in this show. So it's, it kind of went into this pro category just because everything is pretty good except for this few scenes where it kind of happens. Okay, another con. For this one, I've taken some screenshots where I was watching the show because it made me so uncomfortable, but I decided to kind of not insert them into this video because I didn't want to go and revisit them and I didn't want to compile them and put them in the video and I didn't want to have them in the video. But as a con, I would say that upskirt shots or shots that are unnecessarily voyeuristic. There's some shots where it's kind of unrealistic in terms of underwear showing from like under the skirts and stuff like that where the camera is being placed in a way where it's just kind of makes the scene a little bit iffy. I would say that there's a difference between nudity and voyeuristic shots, at least to me there's a difference. So there's a lot of people who complain about, for example, nudity. Um, there's moments where Usagi is in her most powerful form at the end of the last season and she is completely naked with the big wings and I don't see any Anything wrong with that because it's like the shots are very much referring to angelic forms and, and like uh, paintings, old paintings of angels and stuff like that. It's not sexualized in any way. It's not uncomfortable to watch at all. So I don't really care for that to be honest. Especially like the, there's moments like for example Usagi and Chibiusa being in a bath together. Chibiusa is a child. Usagi is watching after her. She's she's washing her whatever. It's not that big of a deal. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that as long as the shots and is the way that they are set up are not voyeuristic. That's the difference. That's why there's some shots that really make me uncomfortable because this is an animation. This is not a live feed of somebody filming some kind of sporting event where or something active happening on screen where if somebody's wearing a skirt, a skirt could come up and, and you could see something or whatever. It's not an uncontrolled viewing experience. This is something that needs to be drawn. Even one second is probably going to... One second of a show was probably going to involve quite a few frames. We know that in, on average one second is like 30 frames nowadays, maybe it's a little bit less in old animations, but in general it is a little bit ridiculous that there are so many like upskirt shots. It's just There's some of them that I don't mind because they make sense or whatever, but some of them are so voyeuristic and creepy that I, I just can't deal with it and I don't want to hear anybody justifying that. It's definitely male gazy and gross and I think that the show would have been better without it, to be honest. There is no need to do any of that for any of the characters. Well, this is a child. Maybe dial it down a little, you know? But it's it kind of gets less prominent and less present as we go on in the series. It's there. You can tell that a lot of male directors were involved, you know? Another pro. The soundtrack, sound effects, and overall sound design. It's, it's really interesting and in my opinion, it's really good. First of all, this soundtrack is iconic. I did not remember anything about Sailor Moon, but when this started from, from my childhood, but when I started watching it, the second the moon, I believe it's Dendetsu or something like that, that's the name of it. As soon as it started playing, it triggered my memory and I was like, oh my god, I remembered this melody my whole entire life. I didn't remember that it was from Sailor Moon, but I did remember the melody. <laughs> And that is just perfect for a show like that because as much as a lot of music in a lot of shows is good, um, especially a lot of original music that's written for shows, it's usually pretty good. It's not as catchy or as memorable or as iconic as a lot of Sailor Moon's music is. There's things like, for example, Usagi's moonstick melody. Each time she would do an, one of her attacks with a moonstick, I believe it was the healing escalation one. Okay. It's 
definitely inspired by some European royal court music maybe something from like 18th century i might be completely wrong but that's just what it reminds me of and i'd say that it's just every time it would start playing it would enhance the experience you would be excited to hear it each time because it's so catchy and you like it so much because the sound was picked really well it doesn't it's not annoying to rewatch an attack or to rewatch a transformation sequence because the music is so good you just kind of get into it you know each time and it's perfect just perfect chosen absolutely fantastic there's other recognizable melodies like tuxedo masks theme huh? not my favorite my personally my favorite but it's very iconic definitely gets stuck in your head the beautifully deliciously evil <laughs> electric guitar that plays every time you kind of get introduced to the new monster of the week or to the current opponent plotting The background tracks that usually slip under the radar due to them being not quite there, being kind of bland, have no place here, to be honest. This transformation music... There's also the Sailor Uranus, Sailor ne Neptune transformation music. There's this theme that's like a very sad melody that Michiru plays usually on her violin. There's just so many pieces for people to appreciate, for people who like classical music arrangements and or futuristic synths. This starlight transformation sequence music. <laughs> It's just so otherworldly, just really makes you feel like it's a bunch of aliens transforming into senshis, you know? Like there's a definitely a difference between the original senshi music and Starlight sen senshi music. And I really like that, that's kind of... it fits them really well. For some of the attack sound effects, the creators chose the perfect sound effect. My favorite example for that would be the Uranus world shaking attack sound in the beginning. <laughs> This deep plunging synth sound, I absolutely adore it. This sound is really something. I don't know what they laced it with, but it's addicting. It's genuinely addicting. I was so excited each time Uranus would show up with her world shaking because just that room sound was so satisfying with the animation of her just like collecting that energy in her hand. Absolutely fantastic, great choice. From this goofy background melodies that kind of perfect for Osage's shenanigans when she's in her civilian form to heart-wrenching violins like this. There's also the not in the show it's part of this like special edition thing but i would recommend to listen to flame sniper song that's supposed to be like by ray by sailor mars it's a goddamn banger And it's just such a good attack too. Such a great attack. I love it. Ugh, it's just so good. Yeah. 
So the first pro we're gonna talk about is fantastic slapstick comedy. The overall comedic timing, the rhythm of line deliveries is genuinely top tier. In general, this show is definitely funny. Whenever they have those slapstick moments, they really do work. It's both partially due to the animation, as we discussed in the art section, as well as in part it's due to the writing because it definitely works well together. There are obviously some people who don't like this type of humor, but I think it's well done here. The stylistic choices for presenting characters' emotions are really well done, as well as the voice actors are really doing a great job. They definitely make the show come alive. I'm talking about the original sound, of course, the original voice actors in Japanese, but I also am talking about the Viz dub. With other dubs, there's one where Usagi sounds like an old lady, which is, it just doesn't suit her at all. But the Viz dub, I think, is done really well, even though a lot of people are really against dubs. I might say that you have to have respect for people who try to deliver the lines in a new language that's not the original language and try to make it more accessible to more people. I'm pretty used to subs in general just because of not being an anglophone so it's like it's like okay with me, I don't mind it, but I also do appreciate when it's done really well because it is a lot of work and it is really important to do for distribution purposes of shows. So I'm gonna also show a few examples of slapstick comedy in this show done really well. There's a lot of examples, but there's a couple that are they kind of immediately came to mind. Obviously, a lot of scenes from the episode that I'm playing right now, but also the Chibiusa moment when she attacks a monster with her pink sugar heart attack and it doesn't work. It's a really well choreographed, well timed moment with a lot of good physical comedy. And my favorite, my most favorite moment out of probably the entirety of this series, I'm not gonna lie, if I ever show someone a clip of Sailor Moon, it, it will always be this. It's Mehmet at the stadium, at the sports stadium. Luckily, the stadium has emptied out, so the two of us can be alone now. Not going to let a no unauthorized personnel sign come between me and my Hayase. Keep your stupid sign. It's just the timing of everything is so perfect. The sound effects, the delivery, amazing. Love it so much. It's really good. Okay, so we're gonna talk right now about a con, and this con is gonna be a doozy. What I call this con is oftentimes shallow relationship with guys take priority over things like relationships with family slash friends. This show is a predecessor to a lot of other shows that have put friendship of the main cast or family above anything else. In the case of Sailor Moon, the friendships and the way that they are treated by the writers are very strange because they keep on jumping around in terms of logic. It it's treated like a trivial thing sometimes and then it's treated like the most important thing other times. It's very inconsistent, which is, in terms of messaging, it's inconsistent. Uh, there's a lot of underlying moments that kind of suggest that friendship are, uh, friendships are not that important based on some people's actions. But then at the same time, there are some moments where it's the exact opposite. There's also multiple occasions in the show where someone says something along the lines of, oh, girls' friendships are weird. Weak. They are unreliable and it wouldn't be important and I wouldn't even mention it if it was only spoken by the characters that are like villains, you know, or antagonists because they would fall into the line of them not believing in love, not believing in friendship, not believing in goodness, kindness, whatever as it usually is in a lot of shows that are based on good versus bad structure. But in this case, we have a few moments where the main characters, the protagonists, are the ones who are saying something along the lines of critic 
criticizing girls friendships as a whole as a monolith which is really really strange to do in a show like this of course it seems like it's a problem specifically of the 90s anime it seems like the original story doesn't involve that however i am not 100 sure if there's any other quotes that maybe i missed somewhere if you've seen something along these lines the same kind of messaging as in the anime in the manga please correct me but from what i remember from what i've seen it seems to be an anime issue which is once again comes down to the fact that a lot of backwards thinking men were making this show too they were part of the process so of course there's gonna be a lot of weird messaging that comes out of left field one of the examples that kind of really threw me off because it doesn't work with the character it doesn't work for the story and it doesn't work for the overall logic of the world of sailor moon is the moment where mako says this once there's a problem friendships between girls can crack and fall apart quick so i think the sooner we get those two seeing eye to eye again the better this makes zero sense for mako's character in general she's actually one of those friends that are reliable it seems really strange that mako would ever say something like that there's another example of things like that with rei and usagi specifically in the anime as well where rei is, is dating first of all she dates mamoru it's like i know that a lot of people don't like that i understand why because i mean i also don't really like that just because i don't think that it suits her character considering that she was kind of not very fond of relationships or interested in relationships ever in the manga except for for the Casablanca Lily's side story. It was obviously a very strange choice, but what was even more strange about it is the fact that they have this weird competition over Mamoru. It's just, it just doesn't fit the characters. One of the most glaring inconsistencies in this friendship slash romance department is the way that romance would quite literally corrupt the ideals of characters without an understandable reason. An example that I want to talk about again is from that episode on the boat with Usagi, Mineko, and her friend from Britain. What I want to talk about specifically from that episode is the fact that Usagi was going to hurt Katerina out of nowhere. Considering that up to this point, Usagi has only turned people back to normal and never heard them before, it was a really weird thing to see her disregarding her regular kind of morals. To kind of elaborate on it, you need to know that the situation in general was about Venus having a crush on a guy who was significantly older than her, at least 25, and Mineko was like, oh god, 14 at best? Probably even 13 to be honest at that point. It's really, really, really bad. And Katerina was the one who dated him later on. She didn't know about her feelings. And after an accident, Venus left. Katerina and that guy were dating. And they didn't know that she was still alive and stuff like that. In any case, in this situation, it's a little bit strange to ever feel like Katerina even did anything wrong. Because she, first of all, didn't know about the feelings. Second of all, Minako was a child. A 13-year-old, 14-year-old at best. Obviously, she wouldn't be even thinking that she would be offending Minako by dating this guy, you know? Now that they met again, Minako asks Usagi not to hurt Katerina, and this is what Usagi says. How could you want to be nice to her? She stole the guy that you love! Even though Usagi is boy crazy, we all know that, and romance is an extremely important to her, we know that, you cannot tell me <laughs> that a girl that has a hard time hurting her enemies that literally kill her friends in front of her, Usagi that helped all the Spectre sisters to redeem themselves, that tried to just hug it out and turn every murderous villain to the good side, would just hurt Katerina. An innocent woman just like that. Takeuchi herself has talked about how difficult it was to retain her vision in both manga and anime due to a lot of old people on the board due to all those old people being men as well and not agreeing with her vision or with her ideas a lot of the time. She said, back then I thought I'm gonna show this old grandpa that beautiful girl characters can be good for business and I'm not leaving my concept in the hands of old men. So I had to work hard to develop a sense of beauty and elegance in my characters no matter what their type was. Back then the old men editors at Nakayoshi magazine thought that I was being stubborn but they didn't much care for the opinions of lady authors. It was a difficult time. She had to even fight 
tried for the color scheme for ideas of having Usagi with blonde hair or with originally she wanted her to have white hair but had to settle on blonde hair which they still weren't happy with because they didn't think that blonde was a good hair color I don't know she basically had to fight for every little thing I'm not surprised that there would be inconsistencies especially in the anime where they had to do a lot of filler and where they were given a little bit more freedom because Takeuchi was really busy with making the main story work I kind of like I understand why there's like inconsistencies like that and I hope that you understand that too because you can tell that it's not all Takeuchi's fault if anything is to be honest so now on to dangerous messaging about romance number two Koan and Rubius and Usagi and Mamoru advice and consistency so there's an episode that kind of shows this parallel between two relationships both relationships being in kind of a turbulent state at this point Mamoru cruelly broke up with Usagi not telling her what the real reason is I guess at this point what Usagi thinks is that the reason why is that he doesn't think that they should be dating just because they dated in the past life he didn't tell her the real reason now he also has been quite cruel to her afterwards with rejecting her and other things like that we've got a few examples of that already by that point with Koan she is shown to be infatuated with Rubius who sends her mixed signals sometimes he is extremely nice to her and then he turns around and immediately he's cruel to her again so now because Koan in this episode pretends to be a makeup saleswoman she gets to talk to Rei and Usagi directly without them knowing that they are rivals for a little bit so they talk about their current romantic entanglements and Rei says this just believe in him no matter how coldly he treats you eventually he's bound to come around and things will go back to normal again you really think so it'll be fine which is not like her at all but Koan disagrees while she is also following this advice 100% because Rubius is nothing but a dick to her so then she proposes that Usagi should move on and focus on makeup and fashion to make herself desirable which is something that this show continually does with the Spectre sisters the show's narrative is adamant at convincing the audience that being evil is somehow connected to being into makeup, fashion and your looks and if you care about those things you're gonna end up like Koan in love with someone like Rubius who treats you badly because you're shallow or something along those lines weird messaging but the parallel between Usagi and Mamoru and Koan and Rubius is even worse here we have two couples in which both women are being treated poorly with the man constantly switching between behavior that suggests affection and then followed by cruelty both Usagi and Koan can only guess about what's going on why they're being treated this way there is zero communication and through the interaction between the three girls at the table it's clear that the messaging of the show heavily relies on the fact that the audience knows true intentions of these two men but the truth of the matter is that neither one of the women do so the situation is virtually the same but they're treated differently until the very final confrontation with Rubius there re really isn't any difference between what Koan knows about her relationship with Rubius and what Usagi knows about her relationship with Mamoru both are just asked to have blind faith with evidence pointing towards abuse rather than just like a rift in a relationship the most important quote is of course by Rei at the table because she is one of the main characters and Usagi is too Usagi and Mamoru's relationship is holding on only due to their past lives where they were briefly together and the fact that Usagi should have some trust into him because he might help her in battle which is also kind of parallel by what what Rei does with Yuichiro she was really mean to him in the beginning of the episode which I don't understand why again it's inconsistencies of character it's really confusing and then at the end they're fighting and she says all this stuff about how he is so great and whatever and it's like well why didn't you treat him well because what did he do to deserve to be treated like that most of the time unless you are in grave danger and then you jump in front of him to save him really doesn't make any sense in real life we don't usually have magical battles where we could dramatically jump in front of somebody to show that we love someone after treating them like dirt <laughs> for most of the time in real life you can only trust what you see and experience yourself on a daily basis if someone's treating you in a cruel way like that chances are they aren't good for you regardless of you thinking that you're a destined couple 
from the Moon Kingdom. Basically, this episode is a mess. <laughs> and um, even though it's interesting to watch, the messaging is inconsistent while at the same time being quite dangerous for young minds to be observing. If you are somebody who has a little bit of more complex view on relationships and you're a little bit older, it's not a big deal. You, you're you gonna see right through this immediately. But for young people, it's a little bit dangerous, I think, because it does normalize cruel and abusive behavior in everyday life. So I don't know. Now onto a pro after talking about a con for so long. The villains. The villains get a lot of time to be developed. They are in every episode. Each villain that in the manga would get maybe a few panels, a few pages. Sometimes maybe they would be in multiple arcs if they are like a really big villain. In the anime, they definitely get more breathing room. You get a lot of great villains. You get Spectre Sisters. They do get a lot of a better treatment in the anime because they all get a redemption arc. It's really great to see. I'm glad that they weren't very one-dimensional. All villains in each season feel like different types of people. You don't get the same kind of redemption arc for everybody or the same one-dimensional I'm just evil kind of behavior. Most of the time their ambitions and their backgrounds, their personalities are expanded upon and in a very good way. Prince the Man and his brother Saphir. They also get kind of a redemption arc. I still don't like the man for obvious reasons. If you've seen the show you know why. But their redemption arc is very interesting too because it shows that most of the Black Moon clan weren't just evil people in the anime at least they have a different um, they have a different background they have a different reason for attacking Earth than in the manga and to be honest I prefer the anime version of their reasoning behind what they're doing it's a little bit more interesting you get witches five they get actual time you get to know them and to be honest characters like Mehmet for example which I already talked about her a little bit she gets this whole personality and like basically she owes everything to the anime because it definitely does a lot for her character because she gets to really shine and gets an actual personality. She genuinely needs to get some kind of a word for that stadium scene. Her as a character, a drawn character. <laughs> we get Nehelenia, which is, she's also, she's a confusing character because her background is a little bit questionable in terms of a lot of logical kind of issues in the world building, but she's a great character. One of the things that work extremely well, in my opinion, is Sailor Galaxia's character. I really liked the way that they approached explaining the phenomenon of chaos. I really like that eventually they arrived at this explanation that the reason why Sailor Galaxia was corrupted is because she took all of the negativity and she stopped it herself. All the all the evilness, she kind of concentrated all of it and sealed it away. But basically the reason why she couldn't withstand it is because evil should be spread upon every living thing. Because if it's spread across everyone, everyone can battle it within themselves because it's not an overwhelming amount of evil. And I thought that was a really good kind of explanation for this, which is very sophisticated for a show like this in terms of just usually in shows where there's a lot of magic and other things like that involved, evil is usually explained as something that people just happen to fall under the influence of. Or sometimes if it's a little bit more new agey, you get this whole structure of, well, evil depends on the eye of the beholder, whichever side you're on, blah, 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 blah. But in this case, it kind of takes it a bit in a different direction, which I really like. Saying that basically, if you just put all the responsibility upon one person, that person is not gonna last. That person is not gonna be able to just sacrifice themselves and take care of everything and everyone because chaos is gonna break out anyway. But if everyone is responsible for battling their own evilness that's inside of them and they take responsibility of those little parts that are in themselves, then it could be managed, which I think is a really interesting way of approaching this type of villain story or explaining evil in this universe. Talking about Galaxia leads us to another pro, the last season. Sailor Stars is fantastic. Usually last seasons don't live up to the hype because it's difficult, it's difficult to do. You have so much build up and sometimes people don't know how long the story is gonna last. So there's some peaks and some valleys that are kind of not quite working with the structure of the overall show because they can't predict when it's gonna actually end, you know? In this case, we actually get this final season that feels larger than the other ones. It feels more high stakes than the other ones. Of course the praise is going to Naoko Takeuchi here because the story itself is really interesting and it does end in a satisfying way. And it manages to introduce new characters that you get to love. And introducing characters in the very last season can be very difficult without them feeling like fan least favorites. You know, usually they don't get that much love, but with the Starfighter, Star Maker, and Star 
star healer, you actually get quite a great addition to the cast. Talking about Seiya leads me to another con, which is the lost potential of Mamoru and Usagi. We all know that the 90s version of Mamoru is kind of like he's a jerk and um, he's not like that in the manga. When I was watching the show, I didn't know about everything in the manga yet and people were kind of commenting when I was talking about it on a community post that he's a lot better in the manga and that they like the relationship in the manga, that's why they prefer Usagi with Mamoru rather than with Seiya. I'd say that Mamoru and Usagi's relationship is so important for the show and for the story in general that it makes sense that they are the ones that stay together and stuff like that. I wouldn't want to challenge that because a lot of things are holding on to this union in this story. However, I think that it was mishandled in both anime and the manga. I know that they get more time in the manga, but they are getting a lot more time as a couple already that kind of goes through situations and gets better as a couple, but they don't actually get a good ramp up to their relationship in their new lives. Basically, they could have been really interesting. They could have gotten a lot of people on their side. And I will expand on that in another point that's going to be specifically about their development of their relationship. But right now I need to mention the differences between adaptations because the anime adaptation definitely makes it a lot worse because first of all, the age difference. This is something that we need to talk about because it's not just a thing that happens with Mamoru and Sagi. It's something that happens with virtually everybody on the show except for the LGBTQ plus relationships, genuinely. First of all, Mamoru in the manga is only a year and a half, close to two years older than Usagi. He's not that much older than her. So she was in the last year of middle school, 14 years old. He was in like first or second year of high school, which is like 16 years old. Like he just turned 16 or something like that. So they were really close in age. There wasn't any creepy differences between their positions in society even because the thing is in the anime she's a middle schooler and Mamoru is a college student that's not even that's not even a senior in high school that's a like he's in college boys like legal age and she's not even close like not even not anywhere close <laughs> the legal line and i know that it's a different there are different laws in japan but it doesn't really matter because we all have different laws there are so many states in america where you could marry a child it doesn't make it good it doesn't make it normal it does not make it okay don't bring the law into this because things like this are just not normal especially when they are a pattern there is this unsettling normalization of inappropriate relationships all over the place. Someone should make a whole list of them. So I did. Let's go over them. Minako, Mako, and the principal. There's an episode where they go to preschool and they are helping out there and the girls have a crush on this principal and they're genuinely pursuing him and not a single one of them goes, okay, you guys, like, he's kind of too old for you, you know? At least make that comment. Like, they could have their childish, you know, crushes on whoever they want, but somebody needs to at least mention that that's not normal. The only thing that kind of stops this whole weird pursuit that they have going on is the fact that one of the preschoolers is actually actually his child. So I was right, he's definitely not appropriate for them in terms of age, but it's a thing and nobody calls it out. Now, second of all, Naru and Nephrite. Oh, well, this one, this one is really, really something. I specifically picked this image of Naru and Nephrite to compare to what the boys who are appropriate in age should actually be looking like for Naru and Usagi. This is a boy from their classroom on the bottom, and this is Nephrite. I think that if someone doesn't see how weird it is, because because the show portrays it as a normal thing, I think that comparing Nephrite to the guys who are actually the right age for these girls would really put everything in perspective. Just look at it. Look how different they look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Weird. The next one, Usagi and Mamoru. Obviously, Mamoru is literally a college student. She's in middle school. Usagi, Minako, and Mako, and Motoki. Motoki such a weird character. There's some moments where he actually says something when he talks about his girlfriend where he's like, oh, I don't want to be keeping her away from her dreams. I don't want her to not do what she wants to do because of me and stuff like that. You're like, oh, like you seem like a nice guy. And then you realize that he has three girls who are obsessed with him, who are definitely very inappropriate for him too, because he's also a college student, just like Mamoru. They're literally at his house cleaning up his apartment because it's really dirty because he doesn't clean after himself. A grown adult 
adult and they're cooking for him and stuff like it's such a weird there's like a, an episode that's all about that and it's 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 weird okay it's weird especially considering that he sees that especially Mako is really taken with him he just kind of uses it to his advantage to get her to clean and cook for him weird gross you can definitely tell that he knows that they were into him because he is not happy with how they react to Haruka when Haruka appears and they're like looking they're watching Haruka leave and they talk about how Haruka is so attractive and he kind of goes mm, like he doesn't like it you know so you know that the guy is aware of what he's doing and this is gross next one Chibiusa and Mamoru well this one is wrong on so many levels and like we'll talk about it because this needs this is a whole other con because it's so insane that we're gonna get back to it Chibiusa and Pegasus Pegasus again first of all he's a horse all right a unicorn <laughs> still <laughs> weird I know that he's a boy in a form of a unicorn still the boy is like at least five to six to maybe eight years older than Chibiusa depending on what her age is supposed to be I know that it's supposed to be 900 years but in the anime she's not 900 years it's not canon in the anime so she's around seven to nine years old maybe 10 years old right the boy is looking at least 14 to 16 he looks appropriate for Usagi not for Chibiusa ah yes Rei and Mamoru we already talked about that again it shows a pattern with Mamoru too demand and Usagi weird as well and not only for the reason of the age you know why that is I don't don't even want to get into that. Mineko and Tiger's Eye. Tiger's Eye. I don't know how old they're supposed to be because they're they're not technically that old because they were created from animals, you know. But they look like they're about 25, and again, it's not appropriate for Mineko. Mineko and Hawk's Eye, same thing. Ray's granddad being a creep to young girls. It's like a whole thing, and it's supposed to be like funny or something, I guess. The only person who calls it out is Ray. Mako talking about an older guy over and over and entertaining to be used to dating a 30-year-old guy at the park. It was so weird in that episode when they were trying to figure out who Chibiusa has like a crush on or whatever the way that they were talking about it I was really happy that Rei was really calling out Mako about constantly talking about an older guy it's like she's nine why would you even <sighs> And also there's one moment where Usagi is like talking to Mamoru and she's like, oh my god, like now that I'm gonna be 16, I could, like we could get married. 16? What is this child bride behavior? No, thank you. Stop it. Stop it. Go study. <laughs> this is ridiculous. The thing is, the show was made for girls, for young girls, which makes this that much worse and makes it feel like our minds were preyed upon. As one of the commenters in my community post about the show said, Butter Bubble said, the worst part is Sailor Moon isn't direct at boys slash men is directed at young girls. For millennials, men have been dictating girls' preferences and conditioning us to settle and accept the bare minimum, or even less than that. We learn what men prefer in a romantic relationship at a very young age, and they tell us what we prefer. It's so gross they exploit our childhood like that. And clearly, the creators prefer little girls to be young and impressionable, so they may be sickening but we've always existed to be object of desire not subjects with desire and i agree with that because it definitely has that kind of pattern the issue is that sailor moon is not the only one that did that it's um it would be more problematic if this show was made in 2020 and we would be seeing this glaring pattern happening right now. Based on other things that happen in the show, you can tell that the show was very progressive for its time, but it still has, like, it still shows a lot of those kinds of relationships that were normalized for us. And I think that it's important for us to critically look at it nowadays. It doesn't mean that you can't watch and enjoy the show for other reasons, but you can criticize this as long as you want to, and it would be valid, I think. Now, the second point is the whole breakup shouldn't have been a thing in the show since it never happened in the manga it makes it a lot worse as i said with rubius and koan it makes it way too similar to those types of relationships and i think that if they would have done it it should have been an actual breakup or maybe not even a breakup but rather have them not date each other immediately when they find out that they actually were in love in their past life because based on what we know they have very basic understanding and basic memories of what happened before they don't actually have memories memories of each other from the previous life it's just like a feeling you know and I think that it would have been a lot better if they actually let them fall in love on screen again and they could have shown us how they fell in love in the past life as well instead of just drawing them looking gazing into each other's eyes and just having this voiceover of this warmth seems so familiar to me okay 
and who is Mamoru? Who is Usagi? Who are they when they are together? I don't care. And I want to care because this relationship is definitely very important for the story. It's very important for the way that it's approached and the, the entirety of the world building is holding on to them. I want them to be better. I want to be on their team. I want to be on their side without being told to be on their side. I want you to show me why I should be on their side. Do you know what I mean? That's why many people prefer Seiya and Osagi because they actually got that. They actually got the build up. They also get like a tragic love story of I wish I met you sooner or whatever, which is also, you know, tags at a lot of people's heartstrings. Basically, show me don't tell me. Don't tell me how to feel. Show me why I have to care. Now, a pro. We're back to pros. Filler episodes. They actually give a lot of room for characters to develop and it's great. This is, of course, somewhat a misuse sometimes, which is a con for some people. That's why people infamously talk about Sailor Moon fillers and other fillers and other shows because, of course, there are going to be inconsistencies in messaging. As I've said before, Naoko doesn't take care of every single word that the characters were saying in the anime, especially when it's not the main storyline. It led to a lot of characters having room to breathe, especially, most notably, Haruka and Michiru. These two are fantastic in this show. We'll talk about them a bit more in another point in the writing section and another point in the world building section, but they are fantastic characters that were handled with a lot of care and a lot of character. The, the crystal version of Sailor Moon shows that without some filler, the anime can feel rushed and the characters are just catching up with the story all the time. Which is not too bad for Crystal because Crystal is not the first, it's not the original source material, it is not the first anime to be made. Most people that are watching Crystal are probably familiar with either the manga or they're familiar with the 90s anime or both. So they don't have to work as hard to make us like the characters that they're showing. However, that does mean that if you start with Crystal, you might not actually get into the story that much because the characters, they're genuinely just catching up with whatever is going on on the screen. Don't have a lot of time to just talk or even just throw a glance or two, you know? It's a lot of jumping ahead. Con! Weird masculinity issues. And characters having questionable morals that are entangled with those issues. There are a few examples that I have to mention that kind of illustrate my point really well. So Usaki goes on a vacation with her family and she has the tuxedo mask, like that little watch thing or whatever it is, the one that plays music and falls out of her coat or whatever because of her brother. Her dad asks her if it's a gift from a boy, to which she kind of says, eh, yeah, kind of, I guess it is, blah, blah, blah. So this is what her father does. What a boyfriend! <laughs> Have you been secretly dating someone? No. So he did this because he was mad that she could be potentially dating. He is a father with two children and a wife in the car. He is responsible for all of their lives because he's at the wheel. And instead of being an adult, he starts driving recklessly. He literally lets go of the wheel entirely, just lets them drive into traffic, into opposing traffic, by the way, because of his fatherly protective behavior that somehow is concerned with Usagi maybe dating someone, but not concerned with his children's lives that are in a car with him, a car that he is responsible responsible for driving. What the hell is that? Ew. There are also multiple situations in the show where men are acting like it's only important to help or save people, in brackets, women, that they are attracted to. One example of that would be Yuichiro saying that he would save Rei when uh, her and Usagi were covered by the avalanche. Don't you worry, Rei! I'll save you! Ah! Same thing happens quite often where the language would suggest that they're there to help the girl that they're attracted to where like any sane person who has the means to help would help whoever is in that kind of danger I don't like it I, I think that it kind of shows something wrong with the like with the inner character of the person if they are only thinking that it's important to save people that they're attracted to like that's weird pro the end of season one it's definitely an interesting point for the series because everything changes in terms of stakes all of a sudden. We kind of went from just monster of the week kind of situation to and, and characters never getting hurt or anything like that, at least not seriously hurt, to characters literally dying one after the other. It's a little bit of a drastic change and it could feel a little weird but it does expand the range of the show quite a bit and makes it a little bit more interesting to observe. I found that the reincarnation was actually genuinely touching. I really liked the way that they approached it and I think it was really well done in terms of it returning everything 
to the way that it was, returning them back to their normal lives with memories lost. I know that some people don't like that because it didn't happen in the manga in terms of the memories and stuff like that, but I still like it because it's in the spirit of what happens in the manga, while at the same time it does set up the new arc of the first 13 episodes of the new season, where they need this filler arc to wait for the next developments and story to be released so they could actually do the same story as the manga. Those stills of Guardians being dead are brutal. And there's also this moment where Rey, like she finished one of the guards and then the other one seemingly kills her, puts her down on the ice, and then she goes, well, I'm not done yet. And it was such a good moment. It's a little bit weird because Usagi is just like, <laughs> she's just standing there. <laughs> I don't know, the way that they decided to go about her, it's a little bit funny. The attack and the way that Rei is actually not dead and she takes care of the last guard and then she dies is really powerful, really well done. And it's really interesting to see because this is the battle where they actually get to do some damage, you know, it's really cool to see. A con! Creepy, weird, unsettling scenes. They were more rampant in the first season, we've talked about this, but an example, one of the few, would be this getting ready for a date thing. The first rule of getting ready for a date, wear a clean pair of underwear. Like, what the heck was that? Why are we all of a sudden talking? Like, the first thing for getting ready for a date is underwear? <laughs> what, why? Why was that even mentioned? Was it, like, that's just hygiene. Why are we talking about it? I don't get it. Unsettling dynamics. Normalization of some creepy behavior. This point is specifically for Chibiyusa, Mamoru, and Usagi. I've mentioned it before, it's kind of an extension of that point. I just kind of needed to elaborate on it because this one is a doozy, okay? This point has been talked about a lot by so many people. I've noticed that some people in like the comments of like different types of videos that I've watched, people were trying to defend it. I don't think it needs to be defended. Just say that it's weird and move on. The whole thing was poorly handled by the creators. I genuinely don't know what the hell is going on most of the time in terms of that, in terms of those Chibiusa moments. Like, I don't know why Naoko wrote that, I don't know why she decided to go about it this way, but Chibiusa having some weird feelings towards Mamoru is a little bit weird, but you know what? She's a child, so it's forgivable because you're like, well, she's, she's like, she could have any types of feelings and just think that it's a crush or something. She's a child. You don't take it seriously. The problem is that even though a lot of people blame Mamoru for this, and you know what? I'm always first to to say bad things about 90s anime Mamoru, but in this case, he actually did not entertain any of it. He never responded to it, he never said anything, he just ignored it like an adult would because you would just kind of go, oh, that's silly. You know, you just, you don't understand the difference between different types of relationships or whatever, that's funny. Like, oh, a child, you know, you kind of just, you don't take it seriously. However, Usagi, on the other hand, is the one that by taking it seriously and getting jealous, without her being jealous, without her making it a thing, it would have been just been just a child misunderstanding relationships and whatever and the names of things, you know. Also, get ready for the dark, the evil Chibiusa. And the worst part, it's this scene. You must loathe everyone and everything, Sailor. Moon. Go on, instill the le What the hell was that? What the hell was that? Who did it? Later on in the scenes, Usagi, she's not brainwashed by Wiseman because she tells him that, oh, like I trust Chibiusa and I trust Mamoru. This would never happen because of that or something like that. And it's like, he's her dad. That's why it wouldn't happen. Like, what is happening? Why is this a conversation that we're having? I just don't understand. Anyway, let's move on from that to a pro because I'm I'm gonna get a goddamn headache. Not every couple is sterile. We actually get Michiru and Haruka, which is a couple that manages to really flip the script. Not being given that much time on screen as like Usagi and Mamoru. Let me explain briefly. First off, I know that a lot of people are talking about this relationship that it's really typical in terms of having a mask and a femme women in a relationship and that it's typical or something like that. I guess it would have been a valid criticism if their relationship dynamic mimicked the way that they look and their aesthetic. And even then, and even if it did, I think that people can do whatever they want and if you're in a relationship that kind of has this structure of mask and femme together, I don't think 
that it kind of revokes your gay card or something like go do your thing do whatever you want of course in media it would be better if we had more examples but i think that this couple actually is exempt from that whole criticism in general just because even though haruka is a racer she's super masculine flirts with girls all the time but i have some evidence here to introduce to you that even though haruka is the senshi of strong winds and other things like that michiru is the one who has the weight of all ocean's depth first michiru making haruka blush in the movie <laughs> <coughs> Second, Michiru adding more oil to fire when Haruka is at Tsusaki's place and they're talking to Seiya. Third, Michiru seducing Seiya. Four, Michiru asking if Haruka needs to be warmed up. Five, Michiru confessing to Haruka about her feelings. Basically, while Haruka can flirt with everyone and have the power in those kinds of relationships when she's flirting with those girls that are completely enamored with her, she's the one being taken off guard when she's with Michiru. Michiru is the one that's more daring out of the two when it comes to relationships and to a lot of things in general. At first, I did not see that, but now I see that Michiru is very different from all those girls that Haruka flirts with because she's the, she's the Haruka to Haruka. Do you understand? what I mean? Anyway, these two are remarkably entertaining as a couple, which is super rare for committed couples. They're usually quite boring. They have something charismatic about them. Really well done. Love it. A con! Erasure of character for some of the main cast. Mostly we're gonna be talking about Minako here because Minako gets to do so much more in the manga. The fact of the matter is, a lot of the senshi, I wish they got to do more because Minako gets to have a sword, first of all. Second of all, it's made out of light or something like that but still a sword second of all she is supposed to be the leader of the group of the senshi she's supposed to be the one who's the most responsible for taking care of usagi and protecting usagi the fact that it kind of it's kind of erased from the anime i think that minako deserves a lot more she deserves a lot better she deserves to have more responsibility and power being shown i think that crystal does it better it shows off her position better there's like for example my biggest problem with season four is the fact that senshis get even less time to compare to chibi Yusa, who's a child and just out of nowhere there, I don't know, it just seems a little bit strange to me that they were kind of not utilized to their maximum potential and I hope, always hoped when I was watching it that they would get more time, things to do because they're great and I want them to be on screen more, which is kind of also ties into a pro of just the fact that the characters are great, you just want to see them more, you want to see them thrive, <laughs> uh, you're kind of invested in their well-being and in getting more screen time. Props and fashion. So the first row we're gonna talk about in this section is fashion choices and iconic designs. I have already made two videos talking about fashion in this show. It was mostly just me restyling this show. Not restyling in terms of changing the outfits, but styling a hypothetical live action of Sailor Moon. I'm gonna link them in the cards. There are some people who love the fashion in Sailor Moon and some people who don't. I am of the opinion that the fashion in the show is great. It's extremely fitting for the surroundings of the show, while at the same time being stylish as a time capsule of interesting styles from the 90s. It's rare to get a show that focuses on supernatural, otherworldly powers while being fashionable and realistic in terms of the characters wearing new outfits or rather having a rotating wardrobe. So I'm going to mention some of my favorite outfits. Just a few. First of all, Ray's white pants outfit. I adore this outfit. It's so fun. It was something really unexpected from the show. I didn't expect them to put her in this pants combo with the pants being flares but also having this low waist in the middle. Same with the cut in her shirt. It's great. And also the fact that she's wearing red. It always will be a great color for Rei in general. The second outfit I want to mention is Haruka's suit. I don't know. Something about it is really great. I also talk about it in a different video, in the fashion video, when I style Haruka. Fantastic. This Michiru's dress, where she's wearing a white fitted dress with some gloves. It looks fantastic on her and it's just, it's a good outfit, you know, with the hair. The combination is really interesting. I love Chibiusa's design when she's evil. 
it's a great outfit the dress is fantastic i also talk about it in one of the styling videos because the way that they drew the material is just so interesting to me and i just love the way that it looks it's a great design have to mention koan of course because this outfit is fantastic literally a mugler outfit also talk about it in one of the styling videos ray's red dress with blue turtleneck and tights under it it's just something about it it's just so 90s and so perfect love it and i've also put this outfit this workout outfit that mamaru has a lot of people complained about it in the past i love it i think it's really cool and it kind of reminds me of the 80s and 90s workout outfits now onto a con tuxedo masks outfit i just can't get behind this outfit i just can't get behind it i can't i think what ruins it is the mask and the top hat i think that's what makes it a lot worse than his other outfit when he's in the form of endymion and his endymion outfit look at this like it's hot <laughs> to compare it to the goddamn tuxedo mask outfit i'd rather take like i'd take this any day of the week anyway not a great outfit another pro the unapologetic girliness of the attacks and the powerful magical artifacts and stuff like that this show really doesn't care what people expect in terms of our masculine expectations of objects that possess a lot of power the most powerful energy in the show is pink and to become powerful you transform and you can wear some makeup and or heels if you want to it's refreshing to see this hyper feminine energy being the one that can any enemy up basically it's a show for those of us that like fashion makeup glitter and like to punish people in the name of the moon okay another con amazon quartet design i don't know how to pronounce their like amazonas Amazonist? I don't know. So the origin for this girl is that they're supposed to be the inner senshi for Chibiusa. All the way in 30th century, obviously. In the show, they are under Nehalenia's control. Their origin is kind of confusing, but basically the reason why I bring up their origin is because they're physically supposed to be the same age as Chibiusa, or around the same point. So considering that Chibiusa is around 9, they would be 10, 11, something like that. So children. This is their design. The issue here is not with how they're dressed per se because they're kids they can wear whatever they want and they shouldn't be sexualized but i have a hard time with the way that they're drawn eight to ten years old doesn't mean that you just get to draw a grown woman and then shrink them slightly height wise and just call it a day if you're drawing a child please just draw a child this type of misstep in terms of simple logic does not look good in combination with other creepy nonsense that we discussed before let's just cut that shit out please like this doesn't look like a 10 year old to me you know the face does she's in stature she's very short but it's just it, who drew them who who thinks the children look like this i don't understand anyway the next pro magical objects design oh man how i like magical objects or iconic objects from stories rich with lore and sailor moon is full of them which is every marketing team's dream they probably were so happy every time one of sailor moon's magical objects got an upgrade or power up or when it got destroyed because that means new objects Objects. and that leads to sales just for sailor moon we got a transformation brooch a tiara a disguise pen a crystal star cutie moon rod cosmic heart compact spiral heart moon rod which is a very confusing object to me i know that there's a difference between cutie moon rod and spiral heart moon rod in terms of their origin depending on manga or anime they kind of flipped the reason why they appeared is flipped but i still don't understand how usagi and mamaru's love created it like why don't they make a bunch of weapons out of their love then why can't they do that if their love is so strong and whatever there's just too many questions i just don't understand why it just randomly appeared whatever the silver crystal itself the holy grail the crisis moon compact the moon kaleidoscope really weird <laughs> design for that one i wish it was a blade i wish the stick part was an actual blade so it's a sword or something along those lines you know eternal moon article eternal tiara holy moon chalice moon power tiara and all of those things 15 objects to be exact are just for Sailor Moon, just for her. All this, not to mention that each senshi have their own like special object. Like for example, each one has a transformation pen. Three have talismans. Here's Saturn's glaive, bunch of talismans. Jupiter has her antenna. Venus has a sword. It doesn't show up in the 90s anime, but I'm gonna mention it anyway because it is in the lore. Uh, Mars has her ofudas. Mercury has her computer and her goggles. Basically, there are a lot of unique objects that have become iconic over the course of the show with almost all characters even side characters having great memorable objects at their disposal the 
first pro is rich references, innovative attacks, fun and beautiful lore. We touch on this in the art and design sections, but these attacks, magical objects and other things along those lines are all inspired by a variety of things that also relate to each other and build up the Silver Millennium lore, but also builds up the characters themselves. There's no one-to-one -one direct inspiration from planets. In terms of everyone getting similar things from the same kind of mythologies, there's definitely a Roman mythology that's involved most of the senshi have some kind of relation to the planetary descriptors, specifically gods that are associated with them, Roman gods to be exact. Like for example, Sailor Mars wielding fire and having a fiery personality or passionate personality just like Mars, the god of war. Or Sailor Venus being the guardian of love and beauty just like Venus, the goddess. Each one of Guardian's jurisdictions are inspired by planets, but not always by the same mythologies. For example, Mercury has water powers, which doesn't rely on Roman gods or Roman beliefs about planetary alignments as much as it does on the Chinese astrology and water being aligned with Mercury. In terms of attacks, besides the powers being aligned with planets, we also get things like like Ray's ability of divination through fire and most importantly she can use Ofudas to paralyze the opponents or sometimes as part of her overall attack. Her use of Ofudas comes from her career as a Shinto shrine maiden, which kind of shows how senshis are inspired by different types of influences and how their personal lives also influence their attacks. The attacks are just so fun to me. I really love attacks in general, but my favorite attacks would be Venus Wink Chain Sword. Wink chain! This attack is not in the 90s anime, but it is in Crystal and in the manga, so I included it just because it is a very cool attack. Mars Flame Sniper. And the thing with Mars attack from the 90s is that I really like this attack, but I think that it's definitely gonna be more impressive in the Crystal version. And Crystal version is supposed to be released pretty soon, in a few days. I think that it's gonna be in the new movie. But we have a preview and it kind of just, it looks fantastic. I don't know, I really like this attack. Uranus is world shaking. Oh. Hold on! Shaking! Saturn's Death Reborn Revolution. Death Reborn! The only time that we see this attack is when the world is ending, basically. A con. The show's pacing from time to time in terms of overusing the things that are not enjoyable to watch. Example would be Usagi crying. Because even though Usagi is a crybaby, and we know that, and it's not like it's not a big deal that she is a crybaby, it makes sense that she is. The way that they implement it sometimes in the show is a little bit annoying, especially obviously in the 90s because there's more time to do that. And the first few episodes are very difficult to get through just because of the amount of crying and if you don't really like loud crying noise you're gonna have a hard time getting through those episodes but believe me it gets less frequent especially when Jupiter and Mars join the group I think that it just kind of breaks up the pacing a little bit and it makes it hard to keep watching if nothing else is going on on the screen except for a monster of the week and a soggy crying you know but it kind of it goes away so don't worry about it pro power-ups and new attacks I had just have to mention this because power-ups are the best part of any of the magical girl shows even shows that just have magical or superhuman abilities in general I just love it so much it's always one of the best things to ever happen and it's just a point for the writers and the animators to remember how exciting it was when we were kids to see your favorite characters get like a power up or achieve a new level of control over their powers I wish it was more underlying and given a bit more room just because the 90s really had a lot of time for some filler and they could have used some of it to give more time to the senshis to show off their abilities and stuff like that like I would have loved to see more of it but still there's quite a bit of it it's not like we're completely deprived of special attacks and stuff like that but still a con a bit too much of the unrealistic who's who it happens with Haruka and Michiru it happens with Tuxedo Mask no one knows who anybody is I think they should have tried more to make it more believable that they couldn't just guess who that person is and I don't mean changing a lot about the person but maybe in the transformation maybe the hairstyle can change maybe at least something to differentiate them because you can see their face you can hear their voice you can see their hair everything about them is this like the exact same as that other person you know 
know it's kind of a complaint that a lot of people have about a lot of shows that involve supernatural occurrences and alter egos and i can suspend my disbelief i'm not that much of a stickler for all of those things but there's a limit you know to how much you can actually suspend your disbelief it's a little bit too drawn out a pro lgbtq couples all around this show is surprisingly progressive for its time in terms of some things we get zoicide and kunzite as well as haruka and michiru not only that but three lights who become an international idol boy group while all three are ladies they're ladies in the manga all the time they're just dressed as men on earth while in the anime they kind of change their form whenever they are in their earth form they are men but they are women when they are transformed into their like, star forms we get usagi who's kind of bi as hell just because the only other two love interests that she has are seiya and haruka haruka michiru setsuna and hotaru being a perfect example of a chosen family and this show treats treats these couples with just as much care as it does other couples, giving them great romantic plots, sometimes even better romantic plots. And it's really interesting that a show that was produced in the 90s has LGBTQ plus couples that are better than so many of the TV couples that we have right now. And not only does Sailor Moon have this representation, they have multiple couples and multiple characters on all sides of the moral spectrum. You don't just get a villain who's gay or something like that. You get villains and heroes that kind of choose whatever they want to choose based on their preferences. The con, the inconsistency of power. There are a lot of moments in the show where the creators seem to have forgotten that characters' powers are on a scale where they relate to each other. If character A is usually a lot weaker than character B, then if character A releases more of a powerful energy than character B, there needs to be a reason for it. It could be due to the character A reaching a new form or that character A given their entire life force for the attack or something like that. But there are a few moments that just don't make sense at all. This whole point was inspired by the scene in the S season where the senshi are surrounded by what I assume is magical type of fire and Ami tries to put it out with her attack, which makes sense since she's a water senshi. And her attack doesn't work at all, so the audience is kind of led to believe that there is some kind of reason for that then Ray tries to stop fire with fire kind of to see maybe that's gonna work and it sure doesn't I thought okay maybe it's a plot device maybe they needed it to happen this way so maybe this fire is somehow different than other types of fire or whatever you know then Chibiusa shows up with Mamaru and it's so weird because English! Sailor Chibi Moon! Luna P takes it out in one second? How does that even make any sense? Surely Ami is not weaker than Luna P. Surely Rei is not weaker than Luna P. I know that they probably wanted Yuyel to get away from them, so that's why they had that whole moment. But even then, it still doesn't make any sense because they have a chase scene afterwards, so it's not like she actually gets to disappear. I genuinely don't understand what the point of that was because all that scene did is just show inconsistency in the powers. They have to relate to each other in terms of what attack is stronger, what kind of circumstances make the attack better. You can't just throw it willy-nilly. I'm not gonna stand for this Sailor Mercury slander. I'm not gonna stand for this Sailor Mars slander. I do not believe that both of them combined are less powerful than a goddamn toy, okay? Another con that I need to discuss is another inconsistency with the attacks or at least with their logic and that's with Usagi specifically. Why does Usagi need to finish every monster of the week? There was an explanation for it at one point. In the beginning, a lot of the monsters of the week were just in innocent people that were taken over by evil energy or by whatever forces may be. It made sense that the Senshi needed to get that monster to be weak enough or at least immobilized in some kind of way so Usagi can do her thing and get them to go back to their normal state. It made a lot of sense, her power is very healing, it's all about those kinds of things. But then we get to the point where we're dealing with science, daemon eggs, we're dealing with objects being turned into monsters so it's totally fine to destroy them and that's what they do they genuinely destroy them i just don't quite understand why that was necessary i know that she's sailor moon i know that the show is about her but the inner 
essentially are supposed to protect her and supposed to take care of everything that's not requiring her type of power specifically. And it's strange because they're supposed to take out this big bad guy and sometimes they actually succeed in it. But then at the same time, there are moments where they can't even take out a minion of a minion. And it just doesn't quite make any sense because again, how does it relate? Why is one thing more powerful than the other one day and then it switches the other? It can only make sense if you have a reason for it, but it's, there's never any reason. It's just random. Just as I mentioned with the design of magical objects, another thing that kind of doesn't really make sense is why sometimes Usagi's brooches would break and would not be able to be restored, why she could all of a sudden create a new object with Mamoru. Like sometimes it's a little bit confusing why sometimes she has that power and sometimes she doesn't. Another pro would be fun and weird sources of magic in the show. So the whole S season revolves around some alien intruders with demons and powers that kind of come from science seemingly. So they are using those daemon eggs and they produce them in their lab. So it's kind of a combination of science and magic or whatever. And it's really interesting because there are different sources for different types of evil and they have different types of powers based on that. So for example, it's a little bit less fun to remember, but Nehelenia's Remless, they are kind of really cool and interesting characters that have an interesting background, especially in the 90s show. The fact that they were actually her subjects in her kingdom, it's really interesting to see that she took their souls away, their dream mirrors, and reanimated them, which is kind of so creepy and terrible, but interesting nonetheless, and it is enjoyable viewing experience to see that different types of monsters and different types of evil in each season have different types of magic, that they don't just have the same type of thing repeating all the time. A con. One of the things in the in this Sailor Moon world that's kind of normalized is body shaming and unhealthy views on dieting and self-image. I have a bone to pick with Artemis. I do. I really do. There's an episode where he shames the girls for wanting cakes. You'll get fat. Shush. <laughs> Fine. Don't complain to me when you get on that scale tonight. And then after, he says an even worse thing. How dare those girls keep me locked up in here while they stuff their fat faces with cake? Fat faces just because they wanted to enjoy some cakes? That's just so extra and so messed up. Like, why would anyone say that? One of the worst examples of the show not handling this type of topics really well is the episode called Slim City. It's the fourth episode of the entire series, and it was one of the episodes that kind of made me not really want to watch the show, and I, I'm glad that I pushed through it and I watched the rest of the show because it's not reflective of what the show is about, but this episode is definitely not great. It shows that Usagi is really unhappy about gaining weight even though there's no visible change in her at all. She tells her family her family is not really saying anything that's helpful and then she talks about it in front of Luna and Luna draws a picture that's very mean to be honest. It definitely is not helpful for Usagi's self-esteem and she ends up not eating the next day because she's so upset about all of those things and it's just not great. And the entire episode is just about a bunch of girls trying to lose weight in very unhealthy ways and the only times Usagi is happy with herself is when Motoki who she has a crush on at the time tells her that he doesn't like really skinny girls and there's this moment at this school where the girls are talking to each other just a bunch of other classmates that Usagi knows and the way that they talk about it is very rude the way that they address each other is very passive aggressive I've tried things like fasting and eating pineapples to lose weight but none of those fad diets ever last for very long Oh, they don't? I really don't like it. And the last pro is, maybe it's a little bit of an unintentional pro, but Usagi definitely is the type of character that continued to do her own thing, even when surrounded by people and cats like Luna. And it's great because regardless of people telling her to act like a normal girl, she just continues to do whatever she wants. And it might be an oversight because the messaging in this episode is not great in terms of weight and everything. But Usagi is definitely an example of not getting down because of people's silly opinions. In conclusion, this show is 
great on many levels. There are some things that aren't good about it because of the era that it was created in. And even though those things are true, and I've mentioned all of them in this video, if you are an adult that knows about all of those things and has critical thinking, you can enjoy the show for its art, its innovation for the time and the characters and magic and other things like that. I would say that it is definitely a must watch for anybody who enjoys animation and loves character design or anything along those lines. And it would be a good watch for anybody who enjoys animation just as an audience participant. It is definitely a classic, a beautiful show, and it is fun to watch regardless of some of the things that are definitely not up my alley. I would say that it is one of my favorite shows now, even though I just introduced myself to it for the first time after, you know, seeing only a couple of episodes when I was like four. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye! Also, look what I have. Use it for all the looks in the video. <laughs>